Hi, I'm Charles Davis, the Dean of Grady College. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this celebration of leadership, storytelling, and social purpose. Ruth Ann, Harry, and Jeff, uh, students, faculty, guests, thank you for being here and joining this convening of bright minds Ruth Ann is inspired here at Grady College today. When you read about the Harnish Foundation and learn about Ruth Ann and her team, you will see that among their goals, her organization is committed to creative communities and convenings that bring people together. We hope that this is the first of many such convenings at Grady with conversations about how we use our leadership and privilege of careers in media and communication disciplines to do good in our world. My appreciation to my partner in good for Grady, Parker Middleton, who had the pleasure and foresight to dream this up and to work with Ruth Ann, Harry, and Jeff inspired by the Hearst Philanthropy Summit, in large part. Please join me also in thanks to Gloria Ricks Taylor. Where are you, Gloria? There she is, who had the pleasure. A consultant to Hearst and director of the Hearst Mag Management Innovation Program, who helped make possible this program that brings executives like Ruth Ann to campus. Special welcome to our students, EMST students, Grady Ambassadors, Cox Leaders, Di Gamma Kappa, Grady News Source, Grady Productions, back there in the back of the room, which is capturing the program. Thanks, Jim. A PR campaigns class working on a safe campuses project and many more. Uh, I meant to mention and forgot when I called out my Di Gamma Kappa kids. Raise your hands, Di Gamma Kappa kids. Di Gamma Kappa kid. Harry yes. Chapman, also Di Gamma Kappa. Harry Chapman, hey Annie, also Di Gamma Kappa. So you guys make sure you all meet one another. Uh, before you go. What a treat we have in store. Seven. Ruth Ann, who after her media career began a life in giving. Harry, a veteran broadcaster from the same Peabody winning Nashville television station as Ruth Ann. And Jeff, Jowdy, who's strategic counsel through his firm to so many nonprofits, enriches so many communities and causes everywhere, including right here at Grady College. Harry, thank you for being our resident Walter Cronkite. Edward R. Murrow and Dick Clark all rolled into one. And Jeff Jowdy, thanks for kicking us off with an intro to the program. Thank you, Dean. And what a treat it is to be here today for this uh, really inspiring session of leadership, storytelling, and social purpose. And Harry, who I'll introduce in a minute, has the privilege of introducing his great friend and colleague but I will share that there has never been a time that I was with Ruth Ann that I didn't leave uh, inspired, challenged to do more, and challenged to be a better person. And I mean that sincerely. So, Now, Harry Chapman, uh, how many of you grew up watching an icon on TV? Okay. So I would like to say I grew up watching Harry, and I did grow up, but it wasn't my childhood years. <laughs> But for decades, when I moved to Nashville, and uh, I would turn on the TV at noon, and I would watch Talk of the Town, and know that the world is good, and all is good, and know what's happening, and what's happening in the music business. And when I first met Harry uh, years ago, I was in awe of this, this celebrity, and I realized soon that he is a Grady grad, and just an incredible man and, and man of character. So he had a 35-year career in broadcasting, most of it in Nashville, but started uh, here in Georgia after he left the Grady College. And among, besides the talk of the town, which was that iconic uh, noon show, uh, he was the stations and the lead station where Luann, um, Ruth Ann worked, the lead station in the, in the, in the um, community, but they also uh, he was the entertainment reporter. And of course, when you think of Nashville, what do you think of? Music. So when you think of all of the notary, notar uh, uh, celebrities of note of country music and beyond and Christian music and, and rock, well, Harry met them, interviewed them, was friends with them. And so he also had a, had a show uh, that covered um, the, uh, the music world. So, and it's the, uh, called Words and Music. And he's, his awards are numerous, too many to mention, uh, but I will mention that he is a fellow of the Grady College, 
and he's a member of the Grady College Board of Trust. He's a past president and still a member of the uh, Nashville Rotary Club. And for the uh, past 10 years after he retired from broadcasting, well, he still stayed in broadcasting after he retired, I guess, from his full-time role, he was in uh, advanced work, development work at uh, Belmont University in Nashville. So uh, Harry and his wife Angela, who was a very special person as well, have three grown children and nine grandchildren. And we're delighted that uh, Harry's here to introduce uh, Ruth Ann and to uh, have conversation with her. Harry? Well, enough about me, Jeff, okay? <laughs> I've been ready to leave now, you know. What else can you say? Uh, it's an honor to be back. Charles, you forgot, uh, I'm mostly known as the comic newscaster on Saturday Night Live. You know, I'm not anything near a Walter Cronkite or a Ed Murrow, any of those <laughs> giants in the world. And um, Jeff, I am a character, not having character. I just <laughs> am a character. You know, this is, you guys, I hope you enjoy your lives and the moments you have together because this woman and I go back a long, a long time. She is one of the most incredible people I've ever met. And, and we first met uh, in the halls of WSB television and radio. Right there are white columns on Pete Street, and sadly, white columns is gone, the place that we dearly loved and was such a pretty place for WSB. Uh, and then I was, I moved to Nashville, and I'm coming in the lobby of the Channel 5 studios one day, and I see this attractive woman, and I recognize the face. How can you miss that beautiful face? And, uh, and, and I'm sitting there, and I said, I know that face. And, Guys, it wasn't a pickup line. I said, don't I know you from somewhere? <laughs> and she said, yes, I think you do. She had on this wig. And, and I didn't know because she had long, beautiful, flowing black hair. And she put on the wig to get the job. Because in those days, it wasn't easy for a woman to get an on-air job at a TV station. Am I not right? Harry, do you remember what my job was? Well, I remember you doing consumer reporting. I was the dollars and cents consumer yes. reporter because that was a girl's job. That's what a girl could do. And they had never had a female sitting on the news set Correct. In, at that television station. I was the first one who got to sit next to the anchorman and say, Chris, would you like to hear about how to save money? <laughs> <laughs> the next time you're in the grocery store. Yes, or something, but know. before that, no woman had been allowed to sit there. Yeah, she broke the ground. And ironically, the second woman to follow you was Oprah Winfrey at that same station, in the same spot, on that same anchor desk. And I got to sit and listen to Oprah get job <laughs> offers every day. <laughs> every day, somebody would call and try to talk her out of leaving WLAC, WTVF, I forget yeah, which one it yeah, was at the time. WLAC, I think it did. But because there was a spreading consciousness that television stations had to do more than hire just white men to present everything, there was pressure from the government because of affirmative action to diversify the people who were on air. So. There was a desperate search for people who were qualified because they wouldn't give us jobs we couldn't get qualified. <laughs> and that's how we yeah. got qualified, was to get a basic job and have someone teach us on the job. And <coughs> Oprah had been well known to the people in Nashville because her dad was a councilman. Mm -hmm. And she was Miss Fire Prevention, Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> And she got a job through dad and through being Miss Fire Prevention right. on, I believe it was WVOL radio. That's correct. She was a teenager, yeah. And I was a kid. When I came, I was 23. And I was a college dropout. I couldn't afford to continue college. My career is astounding, considering that I did not have the qualifications you all are going to have when you leave looking for work. Yeah, I mean. You were 40 over, 
nominated 40 over 40. You received they're just 50 over 50. Yeah, She's they haven't got the 60 nationally. over 60 yet, but I'm 67. I'm yeah. waiting for that. Yeah, well, there's <laughs> going to be 60 over 60. But anyway, I mean, she's an Emmy-nominated reporter. She she had a radio talk show, very popular in Nashville, a newspaper column in the Nashville Banner, um, which was very popular. That, we, that was really unusual at the time. Yeah. It's not unusual to these people. They see people in every medium. But back when we started, it was pick one. And if you had a face for radio, that's where you belonged. <laughs> and you couldn't get out. And you couldn't. And I was one of the few people, Teddy Bart in Nashville, another right. broadcaster, was another who did some print work as well as some television work as well as some radio work, and we were freaks. Yeah. I mean, you've had so many accomplishments. What do you tell, it's what you're talking about right now is so foreign to these young women that are and sitting, men. and men too, sitting and here And any who do not identify as either. Right. How do you explain that to them? Um, if they are watching TV land, they see the world we grew up in, and Mary Tyler Moore newsroom was really pretty much like our news. We had yeah. our Ted Baxters, the, the big phony anchor guy. We had a few of those in the business. And women were discriminated against, and you hired one black person. And that's why, about Oprah, Oprah was qualified because she had that job, so that's why people were calling were for calling, all over the country. Because right. our television station had done the hard work of finding her, qualifying her, and then everybody else wanted to cherry pick her skills. Exactly. And she wound up going to Baltimore, where she failed. Did Miserably. You, did you know that she really didn't do well there? And to work out her contract, they stuck her on the morning show just so that they could be getting something for the money they had to pay her. Surprise! That turned out to be her genius. So a thing to take from that is you may not know where your real genius lies. You may think this is a thing you want to do, or you may be trying really hard <coughs> to pursue something that doesn't seem to want you back. Maybe you belong doing something tangential, something that's kind of like, but not exactly like. Her fortune and her genius came because she failed. And, that, and that's, I'm going to circle back to choices, because you and I were talking earlier about choices. And, and how do you talk to them? You've touched on that a little bit, about choices they're going to make in their lives and careers. Making them right now. You've made a choice where to spend this hour or these minutes. Every choice you make has an effect on what comes next. I didn't know it when I was a kid, did you? No. And so we can sit here and say this, and it's not going to mean anything, but perhaps a few practical, when in this situation, try these escape routes or these plans. I don't try to talk to people this age about career. I try to talk about character, because I don't know about your careers anymore. I scholarship journalism students at Baruch College in New York. And for years, I used to, every year, have lunch with my scholarship students and give them tips from our days and how to succeed in broadcasting. And one year, I went in to have lunch with my scholarship students, and I said, I got nothing. <laughs> I got nothing the biggest media career that everybody your age seems to want belongs to a woman whose body defies description and who got famous in a sex tape. <laughs> I got nothing. Because I worked hard, studied what I needed to study, met who I needed to meet, conducted myself as I was told we had to conduct ourselves, where's the payoff for that today? Yeah. Where's the payoff for that? When acting in a way that you and I were not allowed to act, yeah. <laughs> behaving in a way that we were taught was not a right way to behave, 
that woman had the most successful career in media. And I would be willing to say still does. Is there anybody with a more successful media career than that person? With her game making millions on the app, if you've got her app, you're paying her money, she's, I don't get it. So you said you were a character, but I want to tell you, you have character and you are one of the people of my career who stands out for having character because it's not always evident. We worked together at a time when the sports guy was allowed to call every woman in the newsroom panties. He didn't bother to learn our names. We were just women and had nothing to, oh yes, that gay every day. Panties, hand me that script. He did not bother to learn our names. And he was permitted, because, yes, you look amazed. Who was gonna stop him? Who was gonna stop him? because that was the culture. As a woman, I could be sitting in the ladies' room and see under the stall next to me, do you remember whose feet might have been under the stall? He knows, because everybody knew. You know how Harvey Weinstein, everybody knew, but nobody did anything? This is the way it was in our newsroom and in everybody's office not just newsrooms, not just media, everybody's office. But there was one of my male co-workers who liked to use the ladies' room. It was cleaner and you could see body parts of women. And he was unabashed about it. And no one stopped him. And no one could, because no. that was the culture. Yep. And so you can imagine how difficult it might have been to be taken seriously as a journalist when you were female, showing up someplace and being treated as if you were a joke. The first time I went to the Tennessee State Prison to do any kind of reporting work, the warden was offended that they had sent a girl and he showed me what he thought of me. He locked me in a cell with an inmate and said, ask him what he's in for. I'm Guessing you can guess what he was in for. Rape. Yes, he was in for rape. And that was the warden's idea of a joke. And anybody ever see Beetlejuice, the movie Beetlejuice? You know, when they were raising them from the dead and Alec Baldwin and Gina Davis look at each other and they look so sad so sad. That's how that inmate and I looked at each other. Like, he knew what was being done to me, and I knew what was being done to him. And we were just so sad looking at each other, stuck in that cell, the victim of a system. And it's a system that we're telling a different story about today. <coughs> Stories and choices. It occurred to me a couple of weeks ago, after a woman I know, Jody Cantor, changed the world by reporting for the New York Times on what Harvey was up to. And we have just learned through Ronan Farrow that Jody herself was being trailed and investigated by the dogs that Harvey hired to protect him from the truth. I forgot what I was g going to with this. Oh, the culture has changed. I was thinking about, while this was going on, when I was a kid, there were cartoons of cavemen hitting a woman on the head and dragging her off. Have any of you ever seen this image? You have, you're old. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Parker. Is there anybody who's not old who has ever seen that? I rest my case. The culture changed. When I was a kid, when you were a kid, that mm -hmm. was a common oh, image. Absolutely. It was, it was in cartoons. It, it was a, a joke of some kind. But that is how men got their mates in cave days, bash her over the head with a club, drag her back to the cave. And the fact that you don't know that says how much has changed since I was born. And I pray 
that your kids will never know what it is to be in a culture where women are objects, where it's okay for somebody to come up and honk you, which happened to me every day of my career. You know right. this, you yeah. know this. You yeah. know it happened in the newsroom. The same guy with the coming into the ladies' room. Not guilty. Not, not only not guilty, but one of the people who would actually say something to him. You did. You would say something to him. You couldn't stop him, but you did not let him go without somebody going, Vic, cut it out. Vic, stop it. Vic, what are you doing there? You yeah. did that. Yeah. You stood for that. But that man was an equal opportunity molester. <laughs> I watched him wrap himself around our colleague Alan Muse and hump him. Mm. So this is what my newsroom was like. And I hope that in the future culture, men won't think it's their right when posing for a picture to slide their hand either up the skirt like uh, Taylor Swift testified to and happened to me oh, I'm going to say one of every four photos I ever posed for with the public involved a copped feel. Mm. Mm. It it's, was part of the job. Yeah. And God forbid you should ever, I think the culture that you've talked about, hopefully in newsrooms and is changing and has changed. Because I'm, I'm sure the things you're hearing now, you're shaking your head. You can't hardly believe that that actually happened. But it did. But it did. It happened. So things are changing right now because people have decided to tell a different story. Storytelling is how we make sense of our lives. Anybody here see the movie The Hunting Ground? On Cam OK, so you've probably heard of it. Girls your age are the heroes of that movie. College students are the heroes who did not take the world they were given, like the world I was given in which bash and drag. They didn't take the world they were given in which rape on the campus could happen, and you're supposed to be ashamed that you let that happen, instead of he's supposed to be ashamed that he's a beast and a criminal. And they wouldn't take the administrators stonewalling or recommendations that they not do anything about it. They took on the culture and they won. It's not a fight that's over. But I don't think any college campus is unaware of this issue now. And as the movie has the montage of everybody going, we take sexual assault very seriously, we take this very seriously, we take this very seriously, we take all these allegations very seriously, and take it very seriously. Well, I think now we are taking it very seriously. <coughs> I have heard from a lot of my former coworkers in the last few weeks. Can you imagine? Mm. Yeah. I have heard from a number of men who are wondering if I'm going to name their names, who are wondering if I have a Facebook post to write. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the people who did things that were criminal to me are dead. But those who are still alive, no. They know they participated in a culture that was abusive and is now illegal, and the things that they took for granted and the ways they talked to us and touched us and discriminated against us. Here's one of my favorites. There's a name um, breaking news story. There's a fire. There's a murder. I can't remember which one it was. <coughs> I got to have somebody get out on that story. There was nobody. I'll go. I was the consumer reporter. But I, had a, I actually was a reporter. I knew how to do the thing. And I said, I'll go. I, I'm, he said, no, honey, we need a real reporter. <laughs> no, honey, we need a real reporter. Honey and a real reporter. They were paying me money to be a real reporter. but. My boss did not see me as a real reporter. He saw me as honey, not a real reporter. That's the story he was telling himself. He's telling himself a different story today. And I think a lot of people are learning that the story they were given is not the story they have to have. 
If we're talking about leadership, the most important story you can tell as a leader is the story you tell to yourself about your own leadership capabilities. You can't be a leader of others if you cannot lead your own self. Amen. Right? Amen. <laughs> most of us have a hard time leading ourselves in certain areas. And if there's one thing that I think I can give to you today that will serve you better than any other thing I could give to you, it's figure out how to make yourself more accountable to yourself so that you can trust yourself to be there for yourself, to be confident in the story of who you are, no matter who's telling you a different story, to write the world as you want to live in it, not as other people are telling you you must, to find character and strength that let you be the person you want to be. I do this, Harry, on a daily basis. I have little checklists of things that I make myself accountable to myself for because it's, it's what makes me feel good about myself. Most of us have a critical voice in our head. Mom, dad, grandma, uh, boss ex-bad boyfriend, somebody, somebody who is saying things in our head that are unflattering, uncomplimentary, frightened, angry. I need to shut up those who are saying to me that I am not who I want to be and what I want to be, who are saying you can't or you're not good enough or you never did that before, why would you try? Or don't bother, you'll fail. I need to shut those voices up with my strong voice that says, you know who you are and you know you can count on you. You know if you make a good deal with yourself, you will keep that deal. And so I make little promises to myself and keep them on a daily basis to keep proving to myself that I can trust me, that I can trust myself to look after myself, to mind what I'm thinking and the story I'm telling myself, we're making it up every day. When Jeff was driving me over, he was telling me about some of the campus traditions here. Did anybody ever walk under the arch when they weren't supposed to? No, you didn't. What kind of silly story is that? We have a story that you can't walk through here and you don't, and you don't because that's the story we made up. Think about that arch as a metaphor for all the stories we make up that somebody told us was true and we accepted it, either because we accepted the source or it seemed to make sense or for some other reason we accepted that story. So I'm saying to you, watch for the stories that others are telling you that you're accepting and watch for the ones you're telling yourself. Sometimes you need a second opinion. In the years that I have known you, I've never known you not to be a confident woman. I've never known that. If you did, you concealed it west. I always, I always said that Ruth Ann always made me look good. I mean, I was the dumb anchor. I was the Ted Knight. I, I, and I truly believe that in my own mind. But I could throw her anything and she would make me look like a genius. So my question to you is who are the voices that you heard? Oh, I had, I, I often say they're deceased now, raised by wolves. Uh, people were not kind in our home. The, the child rearing philosophy was keep criticizing, they'll improve. That if you ever let them think they're doing anything right, they'll stop improving. So I never hear a compliment in my head. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the first time in my life that my father told me he was proud of me was after I married my second husband, who is wealthy. I had a life of achievement. I, I did well academically. I broke many a glass ceiling. I was one of the top money-earning women in the state of Tennessee 
that wasn't a lot of money. Women didn't make a lot of money. <laughs> but, but I still was 0 0.001 percentile at one point of money earning women in Tennessee. It was never over 50K. But I did well yeah. for a college dropout. I did well for a, a woman in the 60s and 70s making her career. But the only value that there was in that household was you nailed it. You, you married a guy with some money. <laughs> and that was considered success. So I am always hearing the negative. I fired them maybe 30 years ago. They still try, they still try to talk to me, even though long dead, they still try to say things to me. But I thank them for all they did for me and send them on that Because way. it made you work harder. I don't know that it did. I don't know that it did. You say you think I was always a confident person. Did you know I cried myself to sleep? Did you know I threw up before half of the newscasts I was on? Never. Boy, do I feel bad. <laughs> no, don't feel bad. No. Compliment my skill. Yeah, you had a great skill. And Compliment she was my skill because people are always trying to make you feel less than. Yeah. I had to. I had to create something for myself. And you did it. And I was scared every time I got on television. I really, I, you, somebody caught me once with the mic pack throwing up in there. <laughs> it took me, I'm going to say three years before I wasn't throwing up. Really? Mm hmm Amazing. Amazing. It was just always a pleasure for me to have, I always felt good knowing you were there. I wasn't, I wasn't at that stage when you and I worked together. Yeah. By then, um, ever hear the Johnny Cash song, A Boy Named Sue? And there's a line in it that says, I knew you had to get tough or die. I was that kid who had to get tough or die. And it was the same, essentially, on no the TV. job there. Get tough yeah. or die. Yeah. You know that that wasn't a secure work. <laughs> no, anything but. Yeah. Anything but. Uh, let's show a couple. <laughs> if you want to know what Ruth Ann, if you don't mind me sharing a few memories, and we step back. Parker, can you do this for us? Uh, we talk about the wig. There's the wig. There's, There's one the of wig. the wigs. Actually, the one, the initial one was much shorter in a bob. Uh, but and that if was you want to see one. it, it's in the movie Nashville. Robert Altman's 1976 Best Picture nominee. I had a bit part as what was then called a stewardess, which is now called a flight attendant. <laughs> and I wore the original wig in that movie. I learned that lesson the hard way <laughs> between stewardess and flight attendant. And just so you know that she does and did have long, black, beautiful hair, although it's up in that photo. Um, Harry, look at yours. I know. I always think of you as a blonde. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> great now. But, <laughs> but, but we, did, we, we did fun moments, too. It wasn't all hard. So we had some fun moments where we did this fashion show for the country music uh, association, but we didn't get to keep the outfits. That was the only bad thing. <laughs> but uh, anyway, we had some fun. It wasn't all throwing up in the bathroom. You know, it was fun. Yeah. And compared to a lot of things you can do for money, it was a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. And it was important work. I felt every day that we were doing something significant for our community. I felt as if I we're part of the fabric of the community. Mm -hmm. Things like that that we did, that was part of how we were community citizens. I, we couldn't possibly number the times we yeah. emceed something or judged somebody's contest or came and spoke. You were the Rotary president, so you had to get a speaker every week mm -hmm. at Rotary. How yeah. many times did we speak at Rotaries? Oh. All over the Mid-South. Oh, yeah. Just, it's part of the work, or it used to be. Is it like that That's anymore? how you get, to, oh yeah, well, it should be. That's how you get to know. Does that, anybody here work in local news? Do they, do they still go out and do things in the community? Does anybody watch the news? <laughs> if you choose this career, and I hope you will agree with me, you get involved with the community. You do not put yourself back on a pedestal. Because, I, I mean, for years, for the 40 years or so that I worked in television and the media, I was out in the community, and I still have that. And you did the same thing. You we were did. involved. You were, and that's how you're out there. You're, 
you're involved. <coughs> How can you tell somebody about what's going on if you have no idea about what that is? You know, I believe we saw how they did it last election. <laughs> well, because okay. look, media, many outlets caught ignorant, caught not knowing their country, caught talking only to a certain groups of people in certain places, but they missed the story last year. They missed the story. And I don't know, Harry, as people are talking about a journalism career of the future, what does that look like when the chief executive of the nation has declared you the enemy? Instead of seeing you as an ally, as a warrior for truth, as public information, as a binder of wounds and a creator of community, the chief executive has declared that those who dare to ask questions are the enemy of the country. I don't know how I would feel if I were studying journalism today when people are wanting to label anything they disagree with as being untrue, because it's untrue for them. I'm, I'm confused about the state of journalism today. And when you all start talking, I want to hear what you think and what you think you're going into. What, what kind of work are you hoping to do? What are you, what are you expecting to find when you get out there? Because it's not what we found. No. I mean, we were revered. There were three television stations in the weird UHF and the public station, and we were stars. Well, yeah. You could not go to the grocery store without having to sign on. Really, people would s shove something under the stall in the ladies' room and say, would you sign that? I know you're in there. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. My favorite yeah, Shall was I pass it on to Vic? <laughs> <laughs> that was good. <laughs> I, I was paid so little on my first TV job when they finally gave me mm -hmm. a job that I qualified for food stamps. I got my first big raise by saying, I'm gonna do a story about food stamps because I qualify. And they gave me a raise <laughs> that gave me one dollar over what it would take to qualify for food stamps. <laughs> but I, I couldn't afford well woman care at a regular private doctor and I was at Planned Parenthood and my least favorite, one of my least favorite public experiences was being in the stirrups, ladies, and, and hearing something and seeing like maybe seven or eight people around the door frame. We heard you were here, we just wanted to see you. Well, take a look! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we used to be stars. <laughs> oh, yeah. Lord. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. I like that. Yeah, that was but but now there are more stations than anyone can possibly oh. pay attention to, which is good for the employment market. There are so many podcasts that you can't live long enough to listen to all the ones they're putting out today. I mean, just the ones they're airing today. Do you have a podcast yet? Uh, no, uh, I stay away from that. <laughs> I think I, nobody wants to read what I say anyway. Oh, Harry, podcasts yeah. are not read. <laughs> oh, oh, they're just oh, okay. <laughs> Tells you where I am. I do my very best to be on the bleeding edge as an old person, but it's it's hard. I was one of the first people I knew on almost every social platform mm -hmm. when it rolled out, and certainly the only person in my demographic group. I got stalled at Snapchat, and yesterday, I don't know how you pronounce his name, Evan Spiegel, who's the head of it, said, yeah, we have to redesign our app. It's too hard for people. I said, I knew it. I knew it. I <laughs> <laughs> knew it was you. <laughs> Moving on from the glorious media days, how did you decide to start the Harnish Foundation? I will tell you, I lost my last journalism job 
That's how. The Nashville Banner was sold to Gannett, who decided to close it because they owned the morning paper. The Banner was the afternoon paper, and they bought it to close it. That's why they did it. They bought it to shut down the competition. And I had not been without a job since I was 15, essentially, and usually had more than one. And sometimes the, my record in Nashville was five. I had five jobs at the same time. I slept approximately three hours a night. And I did this because, as mentioned, it was hard for women to get a job. And when I had one, I didn't want to quit it just because somebody else offered me another thing to do. So I kept as many jobs as I could. I worked on radio, television, newspaper. I taught at Belmont. You sure did. I had the best business card of all time, <laughs> adjunct professor of oral skills. <laughs> Belmont was Is a Baptist in here, Belmont was a Baptist here? institution and they never knew why I needed so many business cards. Yeah. <laughs> I was passing that one out. Yeah, well, there you go. There you go. <laughs> um, but I started it because I was out of a job. When they closed the paper, I did not have a, a job for the first time. I was scheduled to go that very night to an at-home dinner of the New York Women's Forum. You only get to be in it if they accept you, and they only accepted me because I'd been a member of the Tennessee Women's Forum, which was a whole lot easier to get in. And I was embarrassed to be going jobless to this intimate dinner with professional women. And when they do the go around, where you say who you are and what you do, they came to me and I said, I'm Ruth Ann Harnish and for the first time in almost 40 years, I'm unemployed. And I talked about what it felt like to have lost my job, either that day or the day before. And a very lovely woman, whose name is Ruth Cowan, said, so now you must become a philanthropist. <laughs> and I said, oh, you're right. Now I must become a philanthropist. Because I didn't need to work for the money because, as mentioned, I married somebody with some money. And so I decided to start a small family foundation to try and invest in some of the solutions to the problems that bothered me. And the first check I think I wrote was to the Tennessee Justice Center. Mm -hmm. And uh, last week or the week before, they put me in the Tennessee Justice Center Hall of Fame with other donors. There were five other donors, and they announced that collectively, since the 22 years that they'd been in business, that we had given over $900,000 and I turned to my husband and said, wasn't me! <laughs> you did what? <laughs> uh, really, though, uh, through the years, if you give to something consistently, uh, consistently it does add up. Yeah. I, I had given more than I thought over those 22 years, but five of us, to put that much into helping poor people fight for the rights that are legally theirs, but which some craven government is attempting to deny them. Yeah. That's what we put money in. Yeah, I put, I, I started the foundation essentially because I was out of work and I needed a job and I made one for myself. And it has turned into a life I could not have imagined. Oh, incredible. Because you spent a lot of time during those years commuting back and forth between New York and Nashville, Nashville, as I recall, mm -hmm, that's true. you were kind of back and forth uh, a lot. Mm -hmm. In addition to the Tennessee Justice Center, what are some of the other satisfying projects that you've seen a need to invest in? Well, we'll talk about some of my storytelling later, I hope, but <sighs> yeah, I do a lot there. But we were here to talk about leadership today, so I'll mention my leadership program that I'm really proud of. Young women have a tendency to lose that ability to be confident in themselves around middle school. Mm -hmm. When things start changing in their bodies and their brains and their social lives and they start feeling less than that 
powerful, fearless girl they used to be, because most girls start out that way. <coughs> we got a request at the foundation several years ago from some girls who said, can you help us learn to be funny? None of us ever get elected to class office. We run, we're good, but boys get up and make a funny speech and they get elected. How do we be funnier? And we thought, well, that's an interesting question. And we sent a couple of improv comedians to their school to work with them and teach them how to be funnier. And it worked. And they were happy and they liked it. And we said, wow, that's interesting. <laughs> Wonder if there's something there. And so for the last couple of years, two people at the foundation, not me, Jenny Raymond and Carla Blumenthal, have been working with educators, movement specialists, and improv comedians to create a <coughs> curriculum for girls who are 9 to 13 years old to teach leadership skills through improv and movement. It's called Funny Girls. And we are launching right now with five nonprofit partners. We give them a grant, we train their teacher, and they use their student population to run this curriculum. And we help girls integrate leadership ideas that first help them lead themselves and then help them to develop <laughs> leadership in the group. So how to be resilient, how to be empathetic with other people. Uh, how, uh, those are the kind of things we're talking about. Let's talk about storytelling, because storytelling is one of the reasons we wanted you to talk to these students today. The power of storytelling. Where do you begin? The first money I ever put in anybody's movie was a young woman who had had a tremendous experience in her boarding school. And she thought people ought to see what it's like for little girls in boarding school. I never really even knew there was such a thing. That I, I went to public school in South Buffalo. I did, I did not know that if you were a family with money, you could send your littlest kids off to boarding school. Mm -hmm. And she had been one of those little girls in a boarding school and wanted to tell that story and called it Playing House. And I gave her what was a fortune for me at the time, $5,000, and it was a sizable percentage of her budget. And that film was made and played film festivals. And I thought, wow, that's kind of neat. And the next time I had a chance to put money in a movie was a woman named Katrina Brown whose family had, I knew her because of her wealth. And she had explored the, the, the origins of her wealth and found that her family's wealth came from slave trade that the money that her family was enjoying today, generations and many members of the extended family, had all been built on the slave trade, importing slaves, using them to work sugar plantations in the Caribbean for the manufacture of rum, uh, using them in the North for products. I never had any idea that there were slaves in the North, but apparently <coughs> there were, and this woman wanted to take her family on a documentary journey to discover how they made their money and what's appropriate to do with it since you made it on owned people. And I thought that was worth investing in. And if you want to see that movie, it's still available. It's called Traces of the Trade, and I recommend it. And then one thing led to another. As someone said to me, if you have ever helped anybody make a movie, you will never be short of projects that people want you to make. Because once they hear you will put money in a movie, everybody who's making a movie wants to meet you. I am guessing right now I get no fewer than five asks a day about will you look at my script or will you look at my trailer or can we talk about the movie I want to make. I invest in the Sundance Institute, 
Women at Sundance program to help develop female filmmakers, help them make their second movies. Sometimes it's easier to get your first movie made than your second. Help them <coughs> to learn how to be business people. Just because you can make a movie doesn't mean you know how to run a business, and every movie is a small business. Every movie has its own company. If you watch the end credits on movies, you'll see at the end that this is owned by, and it names the LLC, and it, it's, sometimes it's the name of the movie, sometimes it's the name the movie used to be before they got the current title or something else. Those of you who watch Columbus with us this afternoon, the name of the company is Gin and Casey, which are the names of the lead characters. Maybe that was the original name of the movie, but the company is Gin and Casey. If you don't know when you set out to tell your story that you have to be the business brain that gets that movie made, chances are your movie's not gonna be the one that gets made or seen, because it's a business. So part of what I do is help people learn the business. I help with film financing workshops because you can make a movie without a lot of money, but it's a lot harder, much easier <coughs> if you can pay a crew, if you can travel, if you can do what you need to do. Uh, I invest in other people's books. I'm a book evangelist. I like to help people get their good books out into the world. Mm, I do sponsor some podcasts. A podcast is what radio used to be, Harry. Mm -hmm. People have their own little shows that they record on their computers or their home studios or in big studios, and it's turning out to be big business. There are now companies you can invest in that, that produce and distribute podcasts, private companies and those that are publicly <coughs> traded. Tell us about Columbus, Indiana, the film we're going to see later. <laughs> I love this movie so much. I feel fortunate to love this movie so much because I had nothing to do with picking out the script, hiring any of the actors, doing any of the editing, giving any of the notes. I saw it when it was ready for competition. This is strictly an investment for me. This is not a philanthropic gift. Because after we'd been making grants to movies, and I am so proud of the grant we made to the hunting ground and to other social justice movies like Trapped about the abortion laws in Texas or Audrey and Daisy, which is kind of like the hunting ground for high school, two high school girls that had been sexually assaulted and the story of that. And I have a lot of other mm -hmm. that I've donated to. There's one in theaters right now and also available on iTunes called Unrest a whole political movement. I, I'm just going to take a side note on that. Yeah. Have you ever heard of myalgic encephalomyelitis? Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of chronic <coughs> fatigue syndrome? Okay, that's the same thing. If you had been diagnosed with myalgic encephalomyelitis, you might be taken a whole lot more seriously than if you were treated for something called chronic fatigue syndrome. I'm tired too. You know, people don't take it seriously. A woman of my acquaintance who was a Harvard PhD one day couldn't write her name and started having terrible physical symptoms that came and went. And nobody believed her in the medical office and said she must be stressed because of her upcoming dissertation. Or she started videoing what happened to her. Like, this is what it's like. And that I eventually turned into a movie. She kick-started. I was one of her first big Kickstarter backers, and then eventually I became an executive producer of her movie. And one of the things I am doing now is paying for doctors and other medical professionals to go see this movie. I've bought hundreds of tickets for doctors and medical professionals so that when somebody comes in presenting and they sound like it could be all in their head, you have seen this story of around the world how people are underdiagnosed or misdiagnosed or tortured by their governments. In some countries, people are actually taken from their homes and, and kept under supervision as in they could get up and do, you're indulging them, you're just enabling them to be crippled. So unrest, I think, is going to do for the medical community 
what I think the hunting ground did mm -hmm. in terms of opening up the discussion on sexual assault and consent. Mm -hmm. Columbus, as an investor, my husband and I became the lead investors in a f film production company called Superlative Films, and they owned a slate already when we got in. And we got in because there was a particular movie we had seen a piece of that I liked a lot and I wanted in on. As it turns out, that was the worst movie in the slate. <laughs> the one I liked, they didn't finish to my satisfaction. I, and I'm not really that proud of that movie. But Columbus has an Asian lead and the reason we couldn't, or that, that it was available for us these big studios don't put money in an Asian lead. John Cho is known to millennial audiences for being in The Exorcist on TV now, Harold and Kumar movies, Star Trek. He's a known commodity. But as the lead of this movie, they couldn't get financing because he's Asian. And because it doesn't sell well overseas with an Asian lead, you would think it would. The director is Korean, another problem. And we were proud to put money in to let new voices tell stories. And the first time I saw this movie was on my old iPhone 4. I, yes, I have a wardrobe of iPhones. Watching this big, beautiful movie in bed because my husband's sleeping <laughs> and the producer wants to know, what do you think of this movie? And there's a moment when in my bed watching. Maybe this will be the moment for you when you watch it that you just say, this director's a genius. I'm so proud of the artistic vision of this movie. It's so beautiful to look at, in my opinion, that if and the DVDs are, I, my, I'm, it's available on iTunes now, so, I'm, yeah. so I, I got my receipt. I can stream it now. Yeah. I'm going to put it on in my house because I used to do this with Hard Day's Night, that I used to just like to see it when I walked by. I didn't need to hear the sound just to see it. It's such a beautiful movie. Architecture and, and the framing of shots and nature, I love every choice this director made. I'm in love with this movie. It speaks to human relationships, the potential within each of us, moms and daughters, dads and sons, life and death. It's everything. I love it. Hey, wait. <laughs> There's no sex. <laughs> Well, I think we covered that earlier, so we don't need to go. All right, I want to open it up and give the students an opportunity, if you're good with that, oh, to I, ask you uh, I wish any questions. So me. hold Tell up your hand and <laughs> jump up and ask your question. Front row. When you're looking at issues of like social justice, how do you make sure that people don't see something as like having an end point? So like you talked about, you've seen the change for you know, women and in journalism, but making sure that people say, well, it was there and now we're here, so we're good. Like, how do you make sure that people see point. things as I just keep screaming. The question is, how do you stop people from stopping with social justice? We got this far, we're good. I think, for me personally, that's where I think my generation blew it with the feminist movement. As soon as you gave us a couple little things we could do, we said, okay, thanks. And we didn't say, and now equality at home. And now remake work for all humans. Because work doesn't work for the way all humans are. It worked very well if there was a man who went off for a prescribed number of hours in a day with unpaid labor at home, taking care of all the mechanics of life. That model doesn't exist. So yep. work needs to be remade. And I'm not going to stop. Ruth Bader Ginsburg was asked, how many women will be enough on the Supreme Court? And do you know how many <coughs> she says will be enough? All of them. Why? Because nobody thought it was that weird when it was all men. What would be so weird if it was all women? True. And yeah, as long as you have breath, do not stop.
And that goes to the civil rights movement, which we lived through, and, and your bracelets. Yeah. I mean, we, we lived through the civil rights Do you know, okay, movement, yeah. you're number seven. You're number seven. I've been wearing this many Black Lives Matter bracelets for two years, and you're the seventh person to say something. Really? Well, I think it's important. I do, too. I think it's important because we lived through a civil rights movement. As to your point, when does it end? Well, it I think maybe when, as somebody tweeted and I retweeted, when freedom looks like Freddie Gray not getting murdered, when, when freedom yeah. looks like Sandra Bland not being pulled over for a tail. Yeah. That's when it's over. <laughs> Other questions? Stand up so we can see you and hear you. Yes, ma'am. Stand up. Hi, um, I want to ask you, since you tell the stories of diverse voices, how do you make sure that your voice doesn't overpower theirs if you're trying to, like, tell the story of somebody who maybe misrepresents or underrepresents? Drop the mic. That's how. Pass the mic. I, am, I don't accept panel gigs if it's not a diverse group. I, I really think it's up to white people, old people, rich people to step back, <coughs> pass the mic. I know my, this is a thing I have gone through in the last couple of years. I grew up an aggrieved class. I was in a discriminated against class. I was poor and I was female and I was not a college graduate. And there were so many ways where I felt When I looked around a few years ago, I realized I am in, and you used the word privilege, Dean. I, I heard you say the word privilege, and I thought, thank you for saying, just be here, just to be safe, to be in a room where there's food and water and clean air, and where whatever money got you here or whatever influences got you here, whatever made it possible for you to be here, for me, for you to be here, it's such extraordinary privilege. And I have such privilege in my life. I'm, it's the thing that I'm most conscious of. And I have learned, I'm also a certified coach. I am also a trained crisis counselor. I volunteer on the crisis text line and I have had tens of thousands of coaching clients. And well, I lost it. Where was I headed? Help me. What was that? We're talking about coaching clients and yes. the things in the, that we were talking about diversity and. Oh, the privilege. Yeah, privilege. Yeah. The privilege. So th having, <laughs> having seen all these people in all these circumstances, now I recognize I used to be a person who looked at the world this way. Now, I have to keep reminding myself, you're the one with the privilege. And that white women are the white men of, black, uh, of women's spaces. That if, if it's a room full of women, white women are the white men of that space, and rich women are the rich white men of that space. I recognize it. I'm aware of it. And I, here's where I was going with that. The thing I learned in coach training and in counseling is you can never be sick enough to help sick people. You can never make yourself poor enough to help poor people. If I gave away every cent I have, it would not help. I am in a better position using my privilege and my available disposable income to amplify the voices of others. And you'll see in the stories that I produce and the things I invest in, that I am amplifying the voices of others. Mm -hmm. I am not amplifying mine. I don't have a podcast. <laughs> I sponsor, the podcast I sponsor is run by the founder of Pipeline Angels, and their whole purpose is to get people who have never been welcomed in business to create their own <laughs> businesses and, and to be invested in. Uh, the pipeline of female entrepreneurs and the angel investors. So her podcast is about how 
female entrepreneurs sharpen their pitches and learn how to raise money. That's the kind of voice I'm right. investing in. And, and I don't even do a commercial in it. I let them use it to give tips for, yeah. for the entrepreneur rather than, here's a word from your sponsor. Oh, yeah, it's cool. Yes. You know, it's still a negotiation every single time. I never did figure out how to stop the doctor who lived next door to me from every time he talked to me, somehow managing to brush his hand. I know his daughter, I know his family. I don't know how to say, stop it, you dirty old man. I didn't know how to do that. He's dead now too, but. <laughs> uh, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> and sometimes I wonder if today, and I've thought about this, would I be wearing a GoPro? I might be wearing a GoPro. And I might be saying, smile, you're on Facebook Live. <laughs> and I often wonder, is that the thing that's going to save women in these situations? Just having her phone and going, we're on Facebook Live, say that again. I don't know, because partly you're supposed to be sweet. You're supposed to be approachable. You're supposed to be somebody that they can feel relatable to. We're friends you can turn to. Mm -hmm. you remember oh, that? Oh, absolutely. We had a, we had a, a campaign, the, an advertising campaign, that painted the news team, and that was the slogan, friends you can turn to. And people used to turn to us. Like people called up and asked for help with rent or I have a problem. Well, you said you were friends we could turn to. <laughs> and I said, to I would complain. You are setting us up. And they set you up to be somebody that, they, that the public has to like. So you can't be a total bitch. But what is the right thing? What do you do? What do you do? In those situations? Yeah, what do you do? What does the management say? I, as, a, as a student, I talk, and like we have a discussion here about like this the yellow phone to back up. But there's also the issue of we're journalists. We are not the story. We're out to cover it. And what do I do in those moments to keep from becoming something and causing a huge issue within the area we have to cover? Ever since the live murder of journalists just doing their job on morning TV, mm -hmm. I have worried about every one of you. Amen. Every one of you out there. Because I don't know what the answer is in a world where the chief executive of the United States is on record as feeling free to grab women. I, I, I usually refer to him as pussy grabber in chief. His words, not mine. <coughs> because if that's the tone, I don't know what I don't know where respect and civility. Guys like you, Harry, you're a dinosaur. I d you were raised in a different day. <laughs> My mother's still watching. Yeah. And and she told you that when a woman came into a room, you were supposed to stand up. Exactly. You open were supposed the door. to open the door. You were supposed. You have a whole different view of women from your upbringing because that's yeah. the world you were born into. That's right. When I heard Chief of Staff John Kelly talking about how sad it is that, that 
things have changed and women used to be sacred. And I think, yeah, so sacred that you all have created a culture in which you can grab at us secretly and be protected. So sacred that we weren't allowed to have jobs or equal pay to this good day we still don't make the same money. Right. So sacred. Worship us. Yeah, different world. Mm -hmm. So that world doesn't exist where the nice guys would be stepping right up to go, hey, cut that out. I do not have an answer for you. And I don't know that this world has an answer. And if anybody has one, I would really like to hear it for the next time the question is asked. Ruthann Harnish, <laughs> give her a round of applause. <laughs> you can see, again, how she's so good and always made me look good. Thank you. I good love you me. forever, Harry Chapman. I love you forever, Ruthann Harnish. <laughs> Charles? What a great conversation. Uh, thank you, Ruthann. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Jeff, uh, for helping us organize this. Ruthann, in honor of your visit and this convening, the college is going to dedicate a contribution to Di Gamma Kappa, the oldest professional broadcasting society in the world, founded at Grady in 1939, and encompassing alumna from Tom Johnson to Charlene Hunter Galt, to Deborah Roberts, to Deborah Norville, to Amy Robach, to Harry Chapman. <laughs> we hope everyone will join the screening of Columbus this afternoon at 3.30 Fine Arts Auditorium. It's just across the street. You have no excuse. And then we'll be back here for a reception at 545. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your day. <laughs>